In this video, you are going to learn about how language could not have arisen on its own, and there is no possible way. God taught Adam, and there's no way around it. The theory of man grunting language into existence is debunked, and you will learn exactly that in this video. A real quick example is me using this scenario. Let's say I believe that most people push 1,000 pounds. Well, to find out if that's true, I gather 10 people. They try to push 1,000 pounds and nothing happens. So I go, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I need to know more. So I get 1,000 people and not a single one of them can push 1,000 pounds. Now I'm pretty convinced that the average person can't do this, but I need more people. So what do I do? I get 1 billion people, but not a single one of them can push 1,000 pounds. So now I am certain that my original thought where everybody can push 1,000 pounds and can do it easily is completely wrong. So for language to arise, we need a certain amount of people to form the first language. And in the past, there aren't enough people alive. More on this soon. You will also learn that all languages are very young, and all of them arose near the same time. You will also learn which was the root language that all stemmed from, and why. Then, you will learn the actual name of God, which has been lost and hidden throughout time replaced with the word God over 3,000 times in the Bible. Put your thinking cap on and open up the document that I gave you, and let's get started. They tell us that man grunted language into existence, but who are they? Scientists, that's right, not linguists who actually study and specialize in language for a living. So are you going to take some paleontologist, zoologist, or anthropologist theory for human language development from people who know nothing about it nor study it? That's not logical. So before I get into why it's impossible developmentally, neurologically, mathematically, and statistically that language cannot arise on its own, ask yourself, why would man even wait hundreds of thousands of years before using the same skills of today to record history? Speech is a fundamental part of evolution. Even Darwin himself said speech is 95% plus of what lifts man above animals. So no one can say that language has nothing to do with evolution. It most certainly does. And linguistics requires intelligence. Where did that come from? Language as a code only comes from intelligence. What I have noticed from studying stochastic models is that human language could not have arose on its own, and the numbers required for it to have don't come even close to telling the real story. I'm not talking about communication. I am specifically talking about human language. Keep this in mind. Epoch 1 has nothing whatsoever to do with geology, paleontology, or time. It is a period used to denote the transition from a non-language epoch zero to language epoch one. An epoch is a period that represents a state. Epoch zero has no grammar, and therefore no language. Epoch one is the first use of grammar, and accordingly the use of first language. The period between epoch zero and one is not a day, a week, or a year. It is any period of time. It is the gradations which require for the transition between the states. That is why it's called an epoch and not a year. After reviewing all possible stochastic models associated with the age of complexity restraints of human language acquisition, it is clear that there were not enough people and that human mental development could never have allowed humans to invent language. These models are what helped me determine this information to be a fact that no evolutionary theory nor debate can get around. I will get into more detail, but for now I think the first important lesson is on the Markov process. It's far more important to help you understand how this process can be used to show transitions between states from no language to language, which are epochs. Now, draw two circles side by side. In the left bubble, put the letter A. In the right bubble, put the letter B. Your bubbles represent states, state A and B. If we further define these states, we can say that state A represents an epoch of no language and state B represents an epoch of language. We begin with our entire population of the world in bubble A. They can only move to bubble B if they can pass the burdens associated with the age of complexity constraints 
which are based on more than 250 years of medical, psychiatric, and linguistic observations. At Epoch Zero, there aren't enough people in Bubble A to overcome the burdens that move people to Bubble B, and this number is not even remotely close. There are a lot of definitions in math associated with the full explanation, which I will elaborate a little bit on. But I do not want this to be boring or get lost on you. So in a nutshell, it is a population problem where language cannot arise on its own. There weren't enough people at Epoch Zero to overcome the burden of the constraints, and the people don't get to graduate to Bubble B for free they would have to overcome and pass the constraints. If there weren't enough people to overcome the burden at Epoch Zero, then language is not a byproduct of nature. If language is not a byproduct of nature, then language came from somewhere else. If language came from somewhere else, then evolution is false. And because it only takes one piece of evidence to falsify the theory of evolution, I have done just that with this irrefutable evidence. I guess the next best way for me to describe this model is by looking at the multiple cases of feral children who are totally neglected, isolated children as well. Specifically, I want to look at Jeannie Wiles' case because I find this one the most interesting. Using Dr. Eric Lindbergh's and, and Professor Suzanne Cutress's work regarding the age of complexity restraints of language acquisition and then applying the data to a small world population hint, all world populations were considered small until agriculture began, then it forms an infinite no-language loop from parent to child to parent to child over and over and over again. There are no natural exits for this loop. Studies have found once a human is in the loop, they are trapped. There aren't enough people to overcome the statistical burdens. It's not even remotely close, even in a large-scale population. If it wasn't even in the ballpark, then I would give it a consideration. But it isn't, and that means there is no natural path to language acquisition. One would need a population size that is sufficient to meet the burdens that are imposed on the population. Language came from somewhere else, and it seems nature had nothing to do with it. You see, you were raised normally, which means that you were provided with language stimuli, and you met the standards for language fluency before you turned five years old. The defining difference between language acquisition L1 and the second language acquisition L2 is that the age of the person learning the language. For example, linguist Eric Lindbergh used second language to mean a language consciously acquired or used by its speaker after puberty. Language is only learned for L2. L1 is not learned, it is acquired. And there is a huge difference between learning a language and acquiring a language. Genie was a prime example of that difference. We are not talking about communication again, we're talking about language. You can use your L1 for the rest of your life to learn new abstract concepts or for graduations to learn new language, L2. That is not the challenge. Before there was language, there was no language. The challenge was not to get primitive man to use L1 or new abstract words. Primitive man was like Genie, no language at all. She had no L1, nor did primitive man. Dr. Eric's challenge would have been to create grammar, because none existed. You can't compare primitive man challenges to your ability to use your L1 to learn new abstract things. I have noticed that from all the research, that abstract words cannot be learned after puberty, because abstract concepts cannot be understood or learned. That information, I have gathered, comes from the work of Dr. Lindbergh, and his book, Biological Foundations of Language, and more than 250 years of medical observations into all these studies have proven what I'm talking to you about. Let's say today you wanted to prove that human language can evolve and that it can form from nothing. What you would have to do is take every human being in the world and put them together. Now take everybody over the age of 13 and remove them. Now you're left with the people that are, have the ability to learn human language because anybody after that age cannot grasp and learn the abstract concepts to learn language. So wolves do not have a language. They have primitive communication skills. Fish do not have language. They also have primitive communication skills. No professional linguist would say that wolves or fish have a language. To classify as a language, grammar must be present. 
wolves and dolphins, for example, have no grammar. Even my friend's bird, who can pronounce words, again, has no language. Only humans have grammar. So we know fish, birds, primates, and wolves can't talk about yesterday or tomorrow or the past activities or future activities. They can only make sounds about current activities or base nouns. Only human children possess the ability to learn grammar for L1. Adults can then take their knowledge of L1 and use translations to learn L2. But no language-deprived adult can ever learn grammar without L1. If a person has been deprived of language from the age of 13 years of life, then it's over. Another study has found that anatomically speaking, macaques are perfectly well-equipped for human-like speech, even compared with a human. When stimulated, monkey voices sound flat and gravelly, but the words are clear and comprehensible. Then why can't they speak? Because their brains are not the same as ours. We were created different, and in the image of God, and God taught Adam. And all of the observational research that exists just helps prove this point. This is a fact. Since observations and study began in 1644, not a single case of a child over the age of 13 has ever been able to learn language. And that is not based on some creationism or religious belief. This is all based off medical observation over the past 250 plus years, based on all accepted criteria for falsifying evolution theory by professional scientists. This problem beats that criteria, because for evolution to be true, there had to be a natural path to everything that all species possess. Knowing all of this, imagine now the idea that propagates today that all humans, unconnected worldwide, all manage to form language independently and roughly all at the same time, without knowledge from one another. As is obvious now, that theory is obsolete. All languages, alphabets, and writing systems point to Hebrew as their root. The Chinese, Indian, Sumerian, modern English, Greek, Korean, and even Egyptian all began from Hebrew, and we have proof. None of them date older than the biblical timeline. None. It's funny that people think the Egyptians and Sumerians are older only because they said they were, when even their own alphabet comes from Hebrew so that doesn't even make logical sense. The reason the Sumerians got such late dates is because they used a sexagismal base 60 system, as where we use what the Hebrews used, a base 10 system. So for every decade, they added 60. This is why they got such extreme ages when you read the ancient Sumerian tablets. Sumeria never existed much beyond their original boundaries in southern Mesopotamia. The small number of its native speakers were entirely out of proportion to the tremendous importance and influence the Sumerians exercised on the development of the Mesopotamian and other ancient civilizations in all stages. About 2000 BC, Sumerian was replaced as a spoken language by the Semitic Akkadian, but continued in written usage almost to the end of the life of the Akkadian language, around the beginning of the Christian era. From there, it seems to have moved again, and can be found in modern-day Korea. As for the Indian Sanskrit writing, it has also now been discovered that it's not very old either, contrary to what they tell others, or what they might think. The Sanskrit language is based off the ancient Biblical Hebrew writings as well. We have also found evidence using linguistic analysis that the Indian pre-Hinduism writing system, Sanskrit, only originated 4,500 years ago, exactly 400 years post-flood. So it is not as old as they say, and not even close. The Chinese said the year 2002 was the year 4,700. They state that they started their calendar with the flood. The Assyrian calendar is the year 6,768 from man's creation. The Byzantine calendar year is 7,526 from the creation of man. The Hindu Kali Yuga year is 5,118 from creation. The Korean calendar year is 4,656 from the flood. The Mayan calendar began on August 11th, 3,114 BC, the year of creation to them. 
the Hebrew calendar said that the year 2000 was actually year 5760, going all the way back to Adam. The Danes and Norwegians have a king's list that goes all the way back to Noah without any error. The Saxons have a genealogy going all the way back to Adam in an unbroken chain of lineage. And the Egyptians, by observing the movement of Sirius, came to grips with the fact that their year was off by more than five days. This resulted in a change to their method of approximating the year based on what they have seen for nearly a millennia. But it also caused them to wonder why the additional days came from. In addition to account for these additional days, the Egyptians created the myth about a sky god nut. The oldest of recorded capital punishment goes back only 3,800 years. Everything about our history is very young and completely wrong in academia. In contrary to evolution theory, we find that the first alphabet and language ever written down just happens to be the Biblical Paleo-Hebrew. A modern tribe of Sunni Muslims called the Pashtun, now living in parts of Pakistan, number at least 15 million today. Their language still bears trace resemblances of Biblical Hebrew, and the people themselves claim a lineage going all the way back to King Saul. The Keshimari claim to be a tribe from Judah, and their language and dialect and writing system coincide with this. Next, we have Isaac Mosin, who became the founder of Edenix. He is the chief researcher and editor of the base word E-Word Digital Dictionary, who noticed something amazing when he was researching root words for all civilizations, that the words provided the clearest origin pointing to an ancient proto-Semitic Hebrew as the first root word alphabet and language for man. Isaac now has over 23,000 examples to prove he is right. But first, let's go back to the biblical model for the evolution of language and see if it is true. According to the Bible, all people spoke one language. Genesis 11.1 1 tells us, All people had this one language until the construction of the Tower of Babel in southern Mesopotamia. This occurred sometime around 4000 BC. During the construction of the tower, God confused the language of man and scattered the nations. It is at this time the Sumerians from the land of Sumer, known as Shinar in the Bible, speaking a non-Semitic language, appeared in southern Mesopotamia. It is believed that the Sumerians are related to the people living between the Black and Caspian Seas, known as the Scythians. Ancestors of Noah's son Japheth. At approximately the same time the Sumerians appeared in Mesopotamia, another civilization emerges in the south, the Egyptians. The original language of the Egyptians is Hamitic, from Ham, the second son of Noah, and it is also unrelated to the Semitic languages. Those who remained in the land of Israel continued to use the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, but only developed their own mathematical system. The Sumerians continued to use the Paleoform Hebrew script called the Sumatran alphabet. Next, we learn what the Bible tells us that Adam named the animals. We see in Genesis 2.20, And Adam called out names to all of the beasts and all of the birds of the sky and living things in the field. None of the animals are so specialized that a subgroup is named in the Bible. All primordial animal names are generic, bird, raven, and even children of raven in psalms, but never crow, blackbird, or canary. Adam is the Hebrew word for man. It could ultimately derive from Hebrew Adam, meaning to be red, referring to a ruddy color of human skin. According to Genesis, Adam was created from the earth, Adamath, or Ert. It was the original name of earth, and it means dirt. Hence, the word Adam is derived from the Hebrew word for red and from dirt. Thus, it is ultimately indicating that man's origin was from the earth. The amazing part of language is that we can see the magic in it. It tells us that Yahuwah was ultimately the one who set the example for man by giving him his name. According to the Bow Wow theory, which is now debunked, 
all words are echoic, meaning some grunting caveman attempted to capture the essence of a thing by its sound. But we now know this is 100% wrong, proven by the observable evidence that we now have. Now confirmed here again as I explain to you this, and not by modern day science, but because we can observationally see among many thousands of animals' names in history, only a few creatures, like the chickadee, has a echoic name. A larger set of animal names are clearly descriptive, like the grasshopper or hippopotamus, which means river horse. Some of the older, more generic animal names have unknown origins, suggesting that the Bow Wow theory is for the dogs. It is worthless. Now, the world's oldest etymological text is the last place that any academic would look, but Genesis 2.20 relates that Adam called out the names of the beast and the birds of the sky and all living things. So, we must trust that this is true and check and see if it is. The Bible places a profound emphasis on the naming of every person, place, or thing. And what's in a name? Everything especially in the ancient world. Semites are named for the son of Noah, named Shem. The name is the essence of a thing. It's Shem, or reputation. Reputation, or name, is something to live and die for to a Semite. No less than the supreme deity is referred to by the Jews as Hashem, meaning the name. The name is so powerful that to even speak the name in public is blasphemy and punishable by death. Only the high priest once a year is allowed to say the name of God inside the temple. And the name of an animal is therefore far more than a primitive grunting sound that some caveman made. It is used as a device or identification by our ancient ancestors. The name for God, for example, is the Hebrew word Yahuwah. When Moses asked God, Who shall I say sent me? God said to him, Ehia Asher Ehia, which means, I am who I am, or I exist because I exist. You see, Hebrew is an action language, making it easy to decipher, but it also leaves many translational options, all of which can be correct. The diversity of the close details are where the importance are. As you can see, there are two literal translations and both can be stated as true. When this applies to the tetragrammatron, or the YHWH, this is where we can figure out the true name of God. The rules of pronunciation would be placed at the literal translation name of Yah-Wah, because Wa is a closed syllable which overpowers a soft vowel, which is a U. And Yahuwah is three open syllables and no closed. However, this would make his name have a lower value meaning. But this is easily corrected by moving the U to the end of the last syllable, Yahua, making it now having a centennial sound, U, as in school. This automatically shifts the H to the beginning of the first syllable. All Hebrew names are Hebrew words. All of them. The original tetragrammatron, the W or WA, was a non-existent letter. So there was no YHWH, as the W today only represents the vowels U and O. The original Hebrew shape was Y. The Greek shape was also Y. It was called an upsilon. The Latin dropped the stem and it became a V. This is why they get the term Jehovah from today. But this was still sounded as a double O or a double U sound, as in school. But this was all lost in time because of translation when things should have been transliterated. And I can prove this is true with the father's name easily because we see his name hidden in front of our very eyes at every week in church. We just don't notice it. We hear it clearly when they say hallelujah, which means praise ye Yah. So what happened is our letters U, V, and W today 
all came from the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, a letter shaped Y. The tetragrammatron is therefore more accurately rendered as YHUH, standing for the four letters. If preferred, it can be expressed as YHVH, but only if you understand that the V shape should be sounded out as a modern day U. The Latin form of this letter dropped the stem, and since then it became a V. The rounded form U only gained popularity in the 1300s, so Yahweh is the butchered Yiddish version of the name of God. The true Sinaitic Hebrew pronunciation is Yahuwah, which means I am existence. We now know that Sinaitic Hebrew is the oldest writing system ever developed, surpassing Sumerian and Sanskrit. When the Judean exiles returned from Babylon, they brought back the squared Aramaic script that formed into Ostraco, which ultimately replaced the Paleo-Hebrew script. We can see in Exodus 3.13-15, through 15, This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. God's name has never changed, and we can find his name throughout modern day people's names all over. Take, for example, my name. It is Matthew. However, in ancient times, it was pronounced Matat Yahu, which means gift of Yahuwah, or gift of I am. Just take a look at all of these ancient names, and the many names in scriptures which all have the Father's name in them. The name of God has been restricted and removed from the general masses so that they do not blaspheme the name. The Jewish people used to stand in the streets and proclaim the name, screaming Yahuwah into the air, and when the pagans heard of this, they used to call them crazy yahoos, making fun of them, so they made it a law to never say the name of God in public again. They also started removing the name from their scriptures and replacing it with Hashem. Regardless. Whether or not this is the lying pen subscribes, the name of God has been removed over 6,800 times and replaced with the word God. The matter of fact, any time you see a word in your Bible that's been italicized, just know that it is an added word that was not there before. Since so many scriptures tell us to proclaim the name of God, then we know it should not be a hidden secret and should be expressed to all. Man's heart was only evil continuously. God Regretful that he had made mankind, warned that he would send a deluge onto the earth, years in advance, decades. But the heart of man cared not, until it was too late.